Welcome to another Café Rollist. Uh, once again, we travel to the opposite side of the world, pretty much, uh, in uh, Australia with Steve D. Uh, Steve, could you introduce yourself briefly? Uh, hi, yes, uh, I'm Steve D. I am a game designer from Sydney, Australia. I've been working in the industry for almost 20 years or so, um, depending on where you start from. Um, I work primarily as a freelance role-playing game writer and designer, uh, and I've now started to also make my own card games, and I'm running my own company, publishing all of these things. Cool. You present yourself. Your Twitter says that you are the Australian Robin Delo. So, how does that work? Uh, what does that mean? Uh? Uh, that's uh, it reminds. It was based on an old joke where um, uh, there was a the, the Australian who played James Bond. Um, accidentally met um the producer of the james bond movies in uh, in a in a in a barber shop once and the, the he introduced himself as the australian sean connery and the next thing he knew he was he was playing james bond so <laughs> i had i decided to just uh, look get myself known as like hey i might not be robin laws i'm the australian equivalent of robin d laws um whose whose work i i i'm and I, I adore and and um yeah um I figure it's just it's just a little way to to make a joke and try to get myself a little bit more um, <laughs> known, I guess, out there in the world. Um, and uh, yeah, um, all in good fun. Should pick myself an alter ego like that. Uh, by the way, I'm a George Lazenby apologist uh, on Her Majesty's Secret <laughs> Service. It's one of my favorite bonds. So I'm all for Australian James Bond. I think also I think it's from New Zealand, but. Uh, at some point, Sam Neill almost. Uh, there's even actually videos of Sam Neill uh, doing uh, test runs to play James Bond uh, instead. Uh, yeah, I guess it would have been yeah. Pierce Brosnan. That would have been quite cool. Mm, yeah, I think he was actually born in England originally, so he would have been technically ah. British by, by technicality. But there you go. Um, yeah, um, it was. A, it was a. Um, it's a fun story because Lazenby just, yeah, he basically, he had, he was a fairly small actor, but he just pretended like he was the most famous guy in Australia. And, and <laughs> um, Broccoli went home and went, we should get that really famous Australian in for our movies. Um, so never be afraid to, you know, talk yourself up a little bit. Yeah. Uh, you should, might end up being James Bond. should pretend to be very big on the European continent. I, Satin <laughs> Phoenix actually described me to, uh, the staff of Wizard as Mr. Europe, so I should have leaned into uh, yeah. into that. But uh, coming back to you, we got uh, a couple ice breaking questions in the Cafe Rollis, which is a spin off yeah. born out of the, the pandemic. Uh, what is your routine like at the moment? Uh, I assume it's been impacted, like uh, uh, for a lot of us, by the current situation, air quotes. Certainly, it's been changed uh, a bit, but uh, one of my jobs is uh, my, that, that isn't making games is uh, walking people's dogs. And for a lot of people, that didn't change at all. Even though they were at home, they still wanted someone to come and look after their dogs. So that was a thing that didn't slow down very much during the pandemic. Um, so I've been lucky in that regard. I haven't lost that much work. Um, uh, certainly probably the main thing that happened though, is we just stopped having as many game sessions. We lost all our conventions and we lost playing in stores and uh, my local club basically shut down for six months. So uh, that certainly threw a, threw a spanner in the works of, of a lot of things. We all had to learn how to meet online and play test online. So would you say that uh, the second question is actually, did you develop any new interest or skill recently? Would that be running games online or attending online conventions? Yeah, certainly um, we all had to, to wrangle um, online cons. I've, I've also started playing a lot more of my board games solo and buying some just for that, um, which uh, uh, has been good. You know, picking up things like Mage Knight is really great, great solo, and I've been enjoying that. Um, yeah, took me that, that little nudge to just go, I should actually do some more of that instead of just waiting till I have two or four, two to four people. Yeah, the, I think there's... there's complete new branches of the hobby which uh, people discovered recently and I think they will they will remain. I started uh, for Valentine's Day I played my first uh, 
one-to-one -one, uh, role-playing game with my wife. That was a, a, a only treat. We played Final Lap, which is a for the drama game, uh, which was a tabletop game, uh, role-playing, uh, which was quite cool. So, but I think we will play more of that in the future. It's quite nice, actually, uh, solo games and one-to-one -one games in in complement to uh, w the format we are more used to. Absolutely, yeah. Um... So the game we're going to talk about later, Partners, I wrote specifically to be, a, again, a two-player game. Um, because there isn't really enough of that out there, I think. Well, go ahead. Tell us more about Partners. I'm going to put a little... So, uh, Partners, um, yeah, I, I set out to make a two-player game because I was talking to some people who just, you know, play... They tend to just be them and their, their spouse. And um, at that point, I did know about a few, but there weren't really that many games out there. It was before Cthulhu Confidential came out that I was actually starting with this idea. And my, my instant thought was, what's a genre? Because most of my work is very based in emulating television and movies that I really like. And so the first genre that popped into my head that is great for, two, for having two main figures is the detective police procedural television show where there's usually one character who's a little bit more straight down the middle and um, obeys the rules, and there's one character who's a bit of a wild card. So Partners is about that. You're playing, you don't necessarily have to be police, but you're playing people who solve mysteries every week, and one player takes control of the straight shooter, and one player takes the role of the, of the wild card. And uh, it uses a combination of... of um, these kind of journaling techniques that more and more games are using these days as well that I've, I've used in my previous games um, from normally solo play. But here you are turning over cards, getting inspiration hooks and creating scenes together so that you lay out these mystery stories um, just as, as you might have seen in things like Lucifer or Bones or Law and Order SVU or any of those kind of shows. Cool. So uh, is it kind of, uh, you would say, also, I saw recently an announcement that there was a new Mr. and Mrs. Smith show coming with uh, Phoebe Waller-Bridge and um, uh, what's his name? Uh, yeah. Donald Glover. Yeah. Is that the sort of adventure you could play using partners? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, one thing we've really tried to do is to not, pick any particular kind of detectives that you are or, or, or whatever it is. It can be something where you're really definitely cops, but it's it's open to that whole concept. And there's a really wide genre of that, particularly in the 80s and 90s, but it's still around where there's, there's a couple of main characters and there's a mystery every week. And I think Mr. and Mrs. Smith could be a really great fodder for it. Um, you can also imagine that things like... Um, not quite leveraged because there's more of a team there, but things like Heart to Heart or the old Avengers TV show. What I'm doing on Instagram at the moment is just running through every possible thing where we can find examples of this character dynamic um, where you've got these two characters who bounce off this each other. And that's the core of the game is that it's not, you don't have necessarily like skills and, and attributes the way you would in a more traditional role-playing game. It's more about the relationship between the two characters. And the scenes are created around one character sparking the other character in a specific way. And so it doesn't matter whether you're, you know, in ancient Japan or in the, the future. You know, the example game we have is set uh, on a police station on the moon. Uh, you can do any of those actions as long as it follows that so same sort of television concept. It reminds me also of a, a series of movies I'd really like to go to back to uh i'm not sure for old it is probably the the 30s i think it's probably the 30s mm -hmm. uh it was called the tin man and although it was called the tin man it really revolves around a couple a retired sort of gumshoe hardball detective played by michael powell and uh his wife who was a very sort of independent but higher class woman uh very very smart so it, it's a it's an old series of movies that those were serials and it was all black and white but the, the dynamic between the the two characters uh was was really excellent and uh yeah i should i could probably look into that uh, trying to emulate that with partners so yeah. 
Partners is already available for purchase. No, not yet. We're getting the final art and layout done at the moment. Uh, we're hoping to have it out in um, in March, maybe April if, if it doesn't all go well, but um, it'll be really soon. Uh, we, we, we're just going to do a digital cop release at first, um, possibly with some print on demand because the book is looking really beautiful. In the kind of spirit of these things, we're, we're sort of making it look like an A5 booklet that you might have actually bought back in the 80s. Um, and... Um, it's such a beautiful book. We're going to see if we can actually print some off and do some print on demand through um, through drive through. So that's going to be. We're we're waiting for the last pieces of art, and it's always that last bit that where it all starts to come together. But it takes it takes a long time to get the last little things in place. Um, but look for it really soon. Uh, we'll do a big announcement and. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll, if, if anyone out there wants to review it as well, if we're looking for review, reviewers to get the word out. So please get in touch with us. We'd love to see the TV shows you come up with and get the word out there. It is, it is a, it's an unusual beast, this one. Um, it's not your very traditional role-playing game. So I'm nervous about it, but I'm also really excited to hear what people think and to get people looking at it and going, oh, this is a different way to do a role-playing game. It's very exciting how many different ways uh, are coming out uh, of the, the woodwork. Uh, recently, I played Brind Brindlewood Bay, which I guess would have some similarities because it's also a TV show investigation, but it's more you play a group of elderly ladies. But I was really charmed by not only the the concept of it, but the, the mechanics of investigation, which are, are quite, uh, quite unique. Um, we got Simat in the chat room who was asking if it would be available on print on demand, but you, you already uh, replied to that. Uh, going to, and I'm going to have some tie in questions with movies uh, and such. Uh, your next project is Relics. So, what is that about? Okay, yeah, so Relics uh, was our first big um, centerpiece role playing game that we published through my company, Tin Star Games. We published a few smaller indie games, but in 2019, we kickstarted Relics. It's a big beast of a game. I've got a copy down here I can show you. Um, a beautiful hardcover game about playing angels. Oh, nice. Um, in the modern day. Um, so it's set in a world where um, God created the universe and put her angels in charge of looking after it. Uh, but they found that they couldn't interfere with, with human fate without causing chaos, so God forbade them to interfere any further. Some angels disobeyed and came to Earth to try to help. Some angels came to Earth to try to disobey and to hinder, uh, and a sort of cold war broke out between angels and demons. Uh, now, however, it's the modern day. God has decided to solve the problem by disappearing from Earth, slamming the, the gates of heaven shut forever, leaving the fallen angels and demons on earth trying to figure out what to do next. There are powerful uh, items, the relics of the, of, the, of the name that are scattered throughout history. So there's an element of uh, things like the prophecy films and Wings of Desire, but there's also a kind of Indiana Jones, Lara Croft kind of finding these ancient powerful things uh, and uh, trying to avert the end of the world or indeed um, cause it depending on your motivation. So, uh, yeah, that that's came out in 2020, um, and it should be in shelves around the world. We've got a European distributor. Um, we're hoping that that's going to be trickling out around Europe um, by now. Interesting. You, I was thinking of Wings of Desire, but looking at the cover, uh, I was thinking, yeah, it was more in the, the vein of... Uh, Constantine or, or, or Lucifer, yeah. that, that's a rather large spectrum uh, you have from uh, licenses like that. Uh, how does that translate in the, the game itself and maybe the rules? That was something that I actually set down as one of my goals was to make it so that the spectrum of, of things, of angels you could play would cover almost every angel media that I liked. And I, tend, I collected them all. I've always been fascinated by angels. So I just made this huge list of all the different kinds of angels and angelic media now and, and set up the, the game and the system so that you can play a, a really large variety of these things. And you can, we also have a system in the, in the game, which is uh, about the level of power that you're playing at. So you can play at level three where you are dealing with the end of the world and you know, massive changes and, and extremely powerful angels and demons, or you can play at the low end where 
it's more like something like touched by an angel or something. You have limited amount of power. You're trying to sort of interfere slightly. And we have a whole series of um, splats, basically, as they call them in, in the White Wolf universe of angels with different views about humanity and how they should interfere and how they interact. And by selecting your power level and your group and your themes of your game, you can choose what kind of angels you want to tell stories about. Um, but yeah, it was really important for me to sort of go, I want to capture what unites all these things. Um, so there's elements of the religious horror with prophecy and Constantine and Lucifer, but there's elements of philosophy and whimsy and, and loneliness with wings of desire. There's a, there's a whole variety of those kind of stories across there. The, my own experience with playing or engaging with angels in a tabletop role-playing game in a contemporary setting is In Nomine Satanis Magna Veritas, uh, or In Nomine as it was adapted for the US market, which is a French game. But the, the tone of this one was like um, good omens, so very humoristic, but at the same time uh, very irreverent towards religion mm -hmm. in general. Usually you played... Uh, the normal was you would play demons and demons were sort of the the bad guys while angels were sort of more uh, control freaks, uh, if not uh, entirely fascistic figures. Uh, your game is, uh, how does it deal with the, the humor? Is it more humoristic? Is it more serious? Uh, or is it up to the players and the game masters to make their own mind uh, about that if they want to go go dormance on that? There's certainly some room for humor, um, and I think there always will be a little bit of that when you're when you're dealing with um, sort of angelic figures because they tend to have uh, a long view of humanity, and they also are by being so sort of morally upright, they make great figures to make fun of. It's not quite the same game though, as, in terms of tone as in nomine. Um, that was a big influence on me, and I did. I loved it as a kid, um, 20 years ago, whenever when it was out. I was I read it cover to cover. It was a huge influence on my love of angels. Oh wow! And that's why one reason we were really happy to get uh, Dan Smith was the main artist of that game, the American version, um, and he's one of the artists we got for Relics, which was just a wonderful thing, because we wanted to, you know pay homage to um to to nominate uh we we don't come at it as i say with the same tone of course um, yeah but but uh, that gives it a sort of different kind of aspect um in this case it's uh it's i i wanted also to make it because of the same sort of idea of making it allow for all sorts of angels i tried to make sure that it's something that appeals to people depending uh, no matter what your view on faith or yes, religion. Yeah. Uh, so I've had people look at it and go, this is a very, this is very much in touch with me, whether they are atheists or believers. And um, I feel like I've succeeded because they both had strong emotional reactions to it without, uh, I've, I've left a lot of that up to the players to decide, you know. But it's a, it's a delicate subject. I mean, it's dear to, to quite a few people in a, in a number of different ways. And, to be honest, as, as someone who was a fan of In Nomine Satanist, and I think it, it still has a charm, uh, uh, you know, in France, the US adaptation is infamous for, you know, watering down the, the irre irreverent tone of the original French edition. But at the same time, yeah. looking back at it, it's, you know, it, it, it you know, it was, I guess, 80s sort of tone of, it was very reverent, but to the point of being uh, probably quite disrespectful of uh, a number of people's feelings. So uh, doing it with a more modern uh, point of view and trying to accommodate everyone is is definitely a, a challenge. Are, are there specific things you, you did uh, to, to, to succeed at that, that you, you looked at? Um, yeah, certainly, I think, I think it was something that we approached with a lot of care, um, and with a lot of thinking ahead. Um, we didn't want to make it, uh, as you say, something that, that really was insulting to people. Um, and for me, I think I always wanted to make it to make it to be a philosophical game where there was a lot of discussion about you know the the purpose of religion and the and the role of religion 
So it wasn't picking one side, but more asking questions. Uh, but we also like I had a I had a lot of religious people read the work and give me their comments on it. People who were raised in in you know um, Catholic Catholicism and and other Christianities, um, people who would who were Jewish, people who who were Muslims, and getting all of that feedback and just making sure that I wasn't stepping on anyone's toes too much. Um, uh, not being cheap, I think, is the key thing. Not 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 trying to score easy points. Uh, and so I was really I was really um, grateful for the people who helped me with that. And uh, so far, it seems like it's 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 shown. So yeah, it was just about I think I think being careful, being thoughtful, and being interested in asking questions as opposed to making a a, a broad statement. the the art uh, on the cover is, is you still have a, an angel wielding weapons uh does the system you you mentioning the the, the philosophical aspect uh, of the game but uh the visuals themselves they seem to imply there's quite a substantial part of of fighting uh, is that the case and how does the the system yeah. deal with um... that we, we, we did have one time the blurb said, yes, you'll have discussions about what is the nature of good and evil, but you can also kill demons with swords. <laughs> um, again, it comes back to also allowing the players to discuss different options and, and choose the kind of game they want. There's certainly room for a lot of action. We use a fairly generic, uh, simple system. So all the, all, the, um, uh, all the rules are decided with a tarot draw, and it's all simply about... You know, you, it's a, what we call, I guess, the scene base. Like, this is what you want to do. This is the ability you're using. Do you succeed or not? And happening at a high, higher level of a narrative level rather than breaking everything down to tiny little skills and moving across squares and that kind of thing. Um, which means it doesn't matter what kind of scope you want to have, whether how much action versus how much drama, the system will move with you. But certainly there is... Um, if you want to have a high action campaign, there are a huge amount of villains that you can take on. <clears throat> there are very powerful weapons that you can seize and angels are built for combat in some ways. You know, the, the, the angels that we have are in one of the, um, one of the aspects have a flaming sword uh, and uh, can definitely do a, a hell of a lot of damage with it. Um, Classic. Nice. <laughs> yes. No. It's, um, we're putting out a slowly a series of adventures and then we're going to showcase some more of that. The first adventure definitely has, has quite a lot of fighting in it, depending on how you solve the final encounter, but um, certainly angels and guns and, and the end of the world, there's a, there's a lot of explosions and action and all that sort of thing. So you mentioned uh, the, the first adventure is that, are there adventure within the core book? You mentioned splat books. Are there supplements which will be strictly adventures? Are there a campaign in the works or already available? Or do you see uh, that uh, evolving? Yeah. Um, so as to part of our stretch goals for the, for the Kickstarter, we released a book called An Angel's Guide to Las Vegas, uh, which looked at the city of Las Vegas uh, where our first adventure is also set. So that's a first um, <coughs> source book that we've put out. Then we've done uh, a series of adventures. There are two adventures so far in the series, and we are hoping to put out a few more to build up to a series of six telling this big epic story. So the first two of those are out. We should have the third one out around winter, so June, July, August sometime. And um, there's a fourth one coming along, which we hope we'll get out. We're hoping to do an, another Kickstarter later this year in October. Uh, when we will be releasing the first biggest splat book, uh, which is going to be about, it's going to be basically a big collection of relics and adventure hooks to go with them. So those are the items that are scattered throughout history, which have these incredible biblical powers in them and where to find them and what kind of ventures they might cause. We did a survey of everyone, of, of people on the Kickstarter and on the, on the mailing list about what kind of things they wanted. And that was the one that won. So we decided to start there. But we do have some ideas about doing a book that does look further at the uh, the, the factions that the angels belong to, um, and 
then also perhaps a book about about demons and demon law. So it's all about whether we can make the money and whether we can get the interest. Um, we had a successful Kickstarter in 2019. We are going to have a second one, which will also hopefully promote the core book again. So that's the idea is you can get the new supplement, but you can also order the core book if the first time you've heard about it. Um, we are a small company. We do not have a lot of capital. We are waiting, you know, the more that we sell, the more we can do, basically, is the way it always works. With, with COVID happening and a lot of uh, tabletop RPG enthusiasts discovering online playing and a lot of convention also moving online, I, I find it's, it's been, a, well, at least for me, I'm developing my first game, uh, an opportunity to run my game online with people I could not have engaged with and that convention I'd never been to. Is this something you tried yourself or going to... I don't know, uh, Origins or Metatopia or UK Games Expo here, but uh, online? Yeah, um, I was really happy to finally get to, um, to, to Metatopia for the first time, which was great. Um, and to um, a few other cons um, that I could not previously have got to, I you know, to go to Gen Con online and things like that. Um, not having to pay for a, a plane ticket has been amazing. For those of us on a limited budget, uh, they haven't always been amazingly successful in terms of connection, but I have got to talk to people and, um, you know, just catch up with people who in, in, in these wonderful environments that would have been impossible um, without the online connection, which has been great. Um, yeah. And uh, makes me want to save my money and hopefully do it, you know, when, when they come back on, when they start running again, um, get over to something um, in the States or, the, or in Europe. Because it is, it's not quite the same. It has been really helpful um, to go to some of these events, but it's. Uh, I think there's also been some teething troubles where it's like, well, we're not really there. Um, certainly, great opportunity, but I think we're. I think we're actually probably a lot better at now. I'm sure the the, the, the as some countries are coming out of COVID, we're doing really well in Australia. But there's going to be a, a lot more digital cons, and I'm really excited to see how they progress and how we get better and better at those experiences. Yeah, there's a there's quite a learning curve, and uh, personally, I I find that convention which sort of started online tend to be better at being online than convention making the move from a physical convention and trying to sort of in a semi urgent situation come up with something online. Uh, recently, I went to Session Zero Con uh, in Southeast mm -hmm. Asia, and it was truly amazing where they had a map. You could travel around yeah. and designer at their little booth you could visit and you had an auditorium, you had a place with your gaming table and you could run into people because of the, the way it was shaped. Uh, in France, they had uh, CyberConf, which was also very, very interesting. So I really hope the, the big conventions are looking at that. Or I hope either of those conventions will become the big thing online and the physical convention remain the big thing in physical uh or mm. that the the big convention like origins and so on will uh, take a page uh, out of the the booklet of, of those conventions because yeah it's, it hasn't been quite quite there uh, yet huh? yeah um you're absolutely right though yeah i was i wasn't able to get there as much as i like because something came up and the, the problem is with time zones of course um but i did see some of of uh, session zero con and it was amazing yeah uh, I was wondering about your game. Uh, I'm about to record an episode in which uh, of a show we call Film Studies, RPG Academy Film Studies. Uh, we review a movie, and part of the question is what games would be great to play that movie with. And the next movie I'm going to review is Blade uh, from 1998. Uh, do you think I could adapt Blade into Relics? Uh, yes, no, uh, and why? Um, absolutely. I mean, uh, as a lot of people very quickly spot that there is a lot of uh, sort of white wolf in relics. Um, I, you know, grew up in the 90s. I played a lot of white wolf games. I was very influenced by their, the design. And if you look, yes, you, <coughs> you'll quickly see that there are things that are very much inspired by the World of Darkness games. So there's not quite so many katanas, perhaps. And but. Um, <laughs> some of that in the more modern phase but there's certainly um you know 
the angel i mean the prophecy films are very much in that that genre as well and you can think of you know the crow as being um a demonic figure in, as well so there's certainly people with swords and dark knights and cutting off people's heads and <clears throat> all that kind of thing um blade is a, is a perfect example of something that you could easily do with relics you've got powerful factions of demonic like figures you've got lone figures who have a limited amount of power trying to take them on so yeah uh, i would absolutely be recommend <laughs> um it should be as simple as pie for relics to, to do um the blade films i'll make sure to mention it then during the recording uh, we got simat in the chat room who is asking apparently he's quite convinced by your sales pitch uh, because he uh, he posted himself a link to uh, your Twitter in the chat room and asked uh, why uh, the game is up for free instead of pay what you want or the cost of a coffee. Uh, it, sh it should be up for... Well, that would be the quick start, um, I, I believe. Um, I, I would assume so, I yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Look, I have a I have a uh, Patreon which I can put a link to if you'd like to give send me a coffee or, or I can I, I should get a Ko-Fi account. Um, <laughs> I think originally we were just really so keen to get people to look at the free copy um, as we were trying to get attention for the Kickstarter. So it was just like it's absolutely free. It's yours. Take it away. See if you like it. And then you know that's the first step to getting the relationship to getting and then coming on to buying the full game so save that coffee and put it into a copy of, of the full game um and and that way i, I it works out all, all the same yeah, it's it's not actually free you're paying with your contact details and then we can reach you when uh yeah. when it's time for kickstarter that's why we uh, i'm planning to do exactly. it put some Quick, free kick, kick start, a quick start uh, on drive through, uh, and this way you you find people who got interest. It's a uh, it's a way to reach out to to people, uh, I guess. Huh? Great. Yeah, um. So your next so actually relics is more is older than partners. Uh. So what are you working on right now? Is it the Kickstarter for partners, or are you already started on a supplement for Relix? I mean, you, you named quite a few, or you you're still trying to see how things are going. People often say that I'm 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 one of the most prolific designers they know. So I'm always doing a million things. We are not going to kickstart um, partners um, because we're just doing a digital release and it's nice and small. But so we are putting together the final layout and editing of that. I've started preparing for the, for the Kickstarter and we've started writing the supplement that we're gonna launch there, which is gonna be called uh, Treasures on Earth about relics. So we've, we're writing that and we're preparing the plan for the Kickstarter and the advertising plan that we wanna do for that. And uh, I'm actually working on another one when, when all of that's all sort of organization and, and editing and, and layout. The, stuff, the design that I'm actually working on at the moment is, is another game that we're hoping to do further down the track, which is um, going to be, it's, a, it's also exploring the similar idea of, of trying to make a game um, that is more based on throwing out ideas to inspire you to tell uh, a story, but more in a more compact version of in using playing cards. Um, and uh, think of it like Fiasco, but just in one single pack of cards and much faster hoping to do games that take only about half an hour to play and are just full of crazy chaos and storytelling. Cool. So. Do you have a setting for that sort of it? Uh, uh, or a skin? Or is it still classified? <laughs> yeah, at, the, uh, at the moment, we've, we've looked at... We're, we're, we're calling it the walking deck because it's going to be about zombies. Again, to try and help with the sort of chaos of storytelling. It's basically you know, a classic zombie slasher film. Um, so, and we may do other settings in the future. Um, and actually there's some, we're also, um, what we've had to do this in the last year is, is explore online versions. So we're also toying around with trying to make a version of it that we can play online without having to use tabletop simulator or tabletopia or something. So that's a, a new skill we've had to learn. Um, look out for that. If you follow me on Twitter, 
uh, or find our webpage or wherever we are. We're always Tin Star Games on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. We will be doing playtesting of that probably in the next, in the second half of the year um, and looking to release that in the future. Um, yeah, but that's there's always new things coming out and um, hints you can get for for relics. We put, we put up a lot of st stuff about partners in advance um, and we will be all the way up to getting to getting uh, the walking deck out. We'll be looking for playtesters and feedback and and anyone and we'll be uh, yeah showing off as much as we can because we like to include people in the design process. Uh, we think you know that transparency is something that our our fans have so far responded to. So we like to keep doing that. But you mentioned uh, uh, playtesting involving people. Uh... What do you remember of that process with Relics? Uh, did you get some uh, feedback you thought was especially interesting or surprising maybe? Yeah, um, I think one of the things that really, one thing that's always stuck with me is we went to a con, uh, the first con we took it to um, and, and it was pretty rough, but then the next year we, we, we brought it back and some of the players from last year came back again. And they were like, we love this last year. We want to play it again. And that was something that went, oh, okay. We're doing something right. <laughs> That's really good. Um, we were making a connection. Um, what we quick, what we found also quickly is that people really liked the character generation system that we had. And so we made sure to just put that really front and center and, um, and uh, you know, run a lot of demos around that where people just got to make characters because that was a lot of fun. And um, that also sort of influences the system because the way we have the system work is that um, because your angels have been on earth for possibly thousands and thousands of years, we didn't want to have a set list of skills because you, you can't possibly write down everything that you know. So we use a flashback system where oh, whenever cool. you have a scene where you might need a, sk a skill, we flash back to when the angel might have learned that skill in the past. And originally that was going to be a bit more individual, but one thing we worked on um, very quickly is that um, a great mechanic was allowing other people to tell those memories. So you call out for like, oh, where did I learn how to, to crack a safe? But another player at the other table will tell you the answer to that question. And um, we, that was just an experimental idea, but we found as soon as we gave it to the players, we got some incredible results where players found that they didn't always know their characters as well as they thought they did. Mm -hmm. And that changes your relationship to your character when you, when you sort of go, like we had a, a really impressive moment early on. We had a guy who was basically playing an angel who decided to become a policeman. He was a straight guy. He was a, believed in law and order and justice. And then we had a flashback to the time where he covered up a crime. And we decided, and it was like, oh, maybe I'm not such a good cop after all. And slowly with more flashbacks, we added to that and figured out, you know, what was his turning point and why was he making those decisions and what was the what was the front that he presented even to himself versus the actual truth. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, that was where we yeah, it was it led us to really explore questions of identity and 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 um, that sense of discovery that you get in flashback films where the audience sees something and then realizes that they've seen something else. Uh, and in this case, the players actually find out the truth about their characters, which doesn't really happen in most role playing games. You, you are sort of normally believed to be the absolute true author of your game of, and your, of your character. Uh, in this case, you have, you lose some of that control. Other players are going to tell you the actual truth about your character. And then you have that moment like the audience of going, Oh, Oh, I'm not quite who I thought I was. That's really cool, but because I mean, a, a game I keep bringing up on the show uh, is Nephilim, another French game from the '90s, and uh, it's sort of uh, the premise is sort of all about playing those figures from several millennia. But you do have a long list of skills, and uh, the premise is also about memories. But actually, the system doesn't really support that. I mean, you got some memories points, but it's not quite uh, as well. So when you're telling me that, uh, immediately I'm like, oh, I could use that to run my, my favorite setting, which is 
which is Nephilim. Uh, at the same time, it's interesting because uh, I was asking you about the, the mechanic of the system, and I'm surprised that you did not front-hand your pitch with that mechanic because it's very unique and interesting. So uh, it's interesting that it was not the first thing you mentioned when you started talking about relics, I find. I think I'm out of practice from pitching it because I haven't <laughs> been to conventions. For it. Uh, but you're right. It, it, it is something that we usually get to pretty quickly. Um, people are very excited by that. They're also excited by the use of the tarot, which is another thing we found in playtesting. I was, I'm not a huge tarot fan, but we found everyone was like, oh, we really love the tarot cards. So we have our own unique tarot that goes with the game, um, which people love, which is great. Um, and yeah, look, you mentioned Nephilim. Nephilim was also something that I read a long time ago and was a bit at the back of my mind with some of these ideas. And the first review we got was like, this is a lot like Nephilim. So <laughs> if you like Nephilim, I think you will like this. That's how you should pitch it to the French audience. I think you would reach out to uh, a lot of people uh, immediately as a one sentence pitch. It's a lot like Nephilim. <laughs> it could appeal Fantastic. to them. All right, that's good to know. Now I know that, I can tell all the French people that. But uh, uh, I, I know it's always a, a big investment, but uh, and yeah, it, it works better the other way, translating something from French to English in terms of investment, but uh, is a translation to French something you you would consider uh, at some point or other languages like, I don't know, Spanish or Chinese? Yeah. Um, we would love to do that. Uh, we would also love to pay the, the translators yes. <laughs> the, the, um, at the amount they deserve. Um, we were talking to someone about doing a Japanese translation just of the, yeah. of the um, quick start guide, but we don't have the money just yet because we're planning on, on doing so many other things. Um, it could be a stretch goal or it could be something that we do after the Kickstarter. Um, if you are someone who's interested in translating, um, please get in touch wherever you're in the world. We would love to do that, starting with the, the, the quick start guide and then moving on to the extra to the other rules. But yeah, it would be it would be amazing to me to see my game translated into another language. Um, that's I think a, a really beautiful sign that you've you've made a, an impact and a connection. Um, and, you know, it, it also removes a barrier. I would, you know, not having to learn another language to play my game, I would love to give you that, that gift, you know. Uh, well, actually, if you want, maybe you, you already ran into them. I believe it was Montreux uh, on Twitter uh, who translated the quick start for another game uh, with a memory mechanic, which is Nibiru by Federico Sons. Federico Sons, the author, actually recently moved from, uh, he's from Argentina. Uh, he, moved, he spent five years here in London and now he moved to Tokyo. Uh, so uh, if you, you're looking for someone, uh, I, I will try to hook you up uh, on Twitter. And actually, Montreux was yeah. kind enough. The game I'm developing, uh, it's not being translated to Japanese yet. It's not even out. But uh, it does include a um a replay which is something you often find it's a, it's a transcript of a game session which is something uh, you apparently often find in uh, japan uh, in tabletop rpg books so i did one in english and i montreux was kind enough to have a look to tell me if uh, it was faithful to the the format uh, that you you find over there so there, there are some uh, i mean the internet is quite magical and uh, twitter is quite cool to uh to hook up uh, with people uh yeah absolutely by the way people please uh, go check nibiru and xanadu they got a live kickstarter right now for their very first expansion and it's uh it's also a fantastic yeah, yeah. game yeah nibiru is 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 very cool um, and yeah, if people want to want to just help out, if they have the time and the money, uh, the time and the skills, sorry to help us out. Um, and if you want to, like, we always we would also love to see you know people making fan made expansions or rules conversions or something. There was at one point someone talking about doing like a lasers and feelings port, but I don't think it ever came out. Wow. Um, if you've got a favorite system you want to put put uh, put relics into please let us know and, and please go forward and do it we'd love to see it and we'll put it on our website there's there's actually kind of a trend uh, which i find really great of uh, doing clear srds uh, you know really supporting the community to develop their version i mean the, of course there's pbta there's forge in the dark 
uh, now there's a uh, carved in Brindlewood. Uh, is there something you, you'd be interested in doing also, doing something? I, I don't know, what would you call it? Uh, on Angel's Wings? Uh, or... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, definitely um, love to, to, to expand uh, and, and put under and some sort of umbrella. Um, we'll think about a, a good name for it. Um, we will put our support behind anyone who does anything like that um, as much as we can. Uh, the system that we actually used was as already in um, open source. Oh, wow. It's based on a system James Wallace developed, which is called the Fugue system. So anyone can use the system um, and publish stuff. And yeah, we've done some tweaks for Relics, um, but because it's open source, it's all your, it's all already out there for people to use. So yeah, look, we would love, love, love to see. And that means you can also publish your own stuff as well. Uh, um, I think it's very beneficial for everyone because it, one might think that people get into competition around the same system, but actually it's more like you build a a follow up, a community who gets very excited as soon as there's a new Kickstarter with the system, the support and uh, and love. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and and we we <clears throat> we didn't do powered by the apocalypse or anything like that, although we did consider some other existing systems. So we can't, there's a lot of people out there who are like, well, I only play games that are, you know, that use Powered by the Apocalypse. That's what I know. So again, it's like translating into another language. If you can, if, if you can take Relics and put it into your system's language and then someone else can go, oh, now I can experience this game that otherwise was a bit hard for me, then yeah, God, we, of course we win. Um, so yeah, we would love to see people converting it and making their own stuff and whatever, whatever it takes. Yeah, actually, recently I was hearing uh, repeatedly of games for which they, they sort of, yeah, they sort of did that, or is it the opposite? I'm not sure, but like a Trophy, you've got Trophy Dark, Trophy Gold, and on there they got Trophy Colossus coming. But the idea is that you have a setting uh, which people know, but actually you've got different systems to play different aspects within the game, you know, like you would have a special rules for relics to play something more action packed you would have special rules to play something which would be more romance uh, one which would be more mm -hmm. uh, investigation i find it very interesting this idea of depending on what your the purpose of your adventure you are going to even change bits of the system to to lean in even harder uh, into that uh, that genre that you're aiming for yeah absolutely um and that was something that we were we were careful to do to really tailor the system to exactly what we wanted it to do. Um, and I'm also again, it's way way off, but I'm playing around with another setting, which might be science fiction, and using the system there, but using it in a different way again. Um, that's a mm. bit more uh, sort of more like this is quite the way we've done it. it you're more likely to fail. It's a bit more gritty. So this version, is, it's a bit more. It's more high fantasy. Uh, sort of um, uh, space fantasy, so it'll be a bit more higher success rate and a different kind of style, but the same mechanics using a tarot deck. And I think that's the way a lot of role-playing games work, is that it, you don't need to, like, the core dice that you're rolling isn't really where the system is. The system is in the little tweaks that bring out the meaning of those things um, and tailor those things in for the, the, the little details. Cool. Will it be still with a memories mechanic, uh, but, but in space or something uh, different? Uh, not entirely sure. It might be something similar. We're um, thinking about yeah, playing around with the idea where you're perhaps leaping across into, into different bodies as opposed to having long memories, but rather um, transferring into, into other people's bodies or experiences like in a, uh, brains being downloaded into flesh. Still working on the details, but that might be using that sort of idea of like getting memories from a body as opposed to a long life. It reminds me, you were saying memories and jumping. Uh, it reminded me of Omicron, the Nomad Soul, which was a 1999 video game uh, which featured David Bowie. Uh, you, your character would not die, but you would, you, your body would die and you would move into another character yeah. with sort of your, your digital soul. soul. Uh, we are close to the one hour mark. Is there something left you, you wanted to 
to discuss? Uh, no, look, we've covered it all. Please, um, if you're interested in the game, you can find it on Drive Through. You can get it from uh, Indie Press Revolution in the States. We have digital versions. We have the the hard copy. We have the tarot deck. We have the adventures and the supplements. Uh, in Europe, our distributor is Games Quest, um, based in the UK. So if you can't, you know, should be able to get a copy from some of those places. If you can't, contact me directly, and we can send you one out. And just yeah, check us out online and talk about it. We we are building up towards this new Kickstarter, which will hopefully give us a bit more of a presence. But we're just trying to get out there, and and we just want to hear what people think. So if you're playing Relics, if you like Relics, get in touch because we love to hear from you about the characters you make. We really do want to hear about your character, you know? We want to hear about the characters you're making and the games you're running and the excitement you're having because that's what keeps us going. So yeah, please talk, get in touch. You can find us uh, uh, on Facebook and Twitter and uh, or email and I just love to chat to people, so. I would include that's links cool. to all of that in the description of the episode so it's easier for people to find. And also I will add my little uh, drive through or each uh, affiliate tax so if when people do purchase your products they support a bit uh, the real list uh, speaking of support uh, just because this is released at different dates at, in different places so we are uh, in mid February and we just reached our goal on Patreon for a new website so a new website for the real list is coming thank you very much to everyone who's been supporting for the, the patron for a long time and the newcomers who managed to get us across this $30 per month uh, goal. So a new website is coming and there will be more announcement uh, about that uh, very soon. Uh, thank you so much, Steve, and uh, best of luck uh, with your upcoming Kickstarter. Uh, feel free to let me know if you have anything to tag me, if you want me to signal boost anything, retweet and so on and share on Facebook, uh, I will be very Happy to do so. And thanks for staying up late uh, in Australia tonight. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure being here. And I'll, I'll certainly see you, talk to you in the future. Yeah. And thanks, Simat, for joining us and the other people in the chat room uh, today. Do check also Spy Master, which is a game by Simat, if you want to. So if your talks about George Lazenby inspire you, some spy action. Thanks, everyone. Bye.